Nine rocket, and that is a company called SpaceX. How many of you have heard of SpaceX? Very good. SpaceX is a private company started by Elon Musk. He's one of the founders of PayPal. So he started a rocket company, now has a contract with NASA to deliver supplies to the International Space Station. He was the first private company to reach the space station. He has a current contract for 12 missions, and this is going to be the uh, seventh trip up on that contract. Now, the interesting thing about his rocket system, the capsule on top, the Dragon capsule, is reusable. That splashes into the ocean like an Apollo capsule. So this is the first rocket system since the retirement of the shuttle that actually allows to bring things down from the space station. Very important we get these science experiments and things back down. Now, another interesting thing with this uh, particular rocket system, uh, three or four times in the last year, he's tried to bring the first stage of the rocket. That's the biggest part of the rocket. Uh, remember all the way back to the Apollo days. What happened when that first stage ran out of fuel? They cut it loose and they'd go in the ocean. You lost it, right? Well, imagine buying a ticket to go to Europe, you get on a 747, you fly to Europe, they push the 747 in the ocean and they build a new one to come back. How much is that ticket going to cost? Right? Okay. So three times, three or four times in the last year, he's tried to bring that rocket down gently under rocket power and to the ocean. And he was successful. It came down nice and slow. Of course, it fell over in the ocean, killed it. But then more recently, uh, twice, he's, he's put a big barge out in the ocean about the size of a football field. And he's tried to bring it down in a barge. And the first time, uh, there was good news and bad news. Is the good news he had the barbs, the bad news is he hit kind of hard. So that didn't work out. Second time, uh, he tried it, and he brought it down. The record was coming around, it looked pretty good, hit the barge, and fell over. So, almost, okay? He's probably going to try that again this time, depending on the weight of what he takes up and where it's going. Uh, but usually these International Space Station runs, he has enough fuel left to try to bring this back down. So he'll probably try it again. Watch the news on that. And he's already taken one of the old uh, launch pads on Cape Canaveral, and it used to say launch pad, right now it says SpaceX landing pad number one. Okay, after he lands it on a barge, he intends to land it back on a launch pad, and if he can do that, all he's gotta do is fill it with fuel for another capsule on top of and uh, like to fuse. Okay, that's gonna be a big cost saving. It'll change the industry. In fact, uh, uh, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, United Launch Alliance are already talking about a new rocket that will do something similar, so innovation is coming. Are we ready to go? Let's go. exception of as we go through the guard gate. So please don't take any pictures there. I've got no sense of humor. Now a lot of times people want to know why did they build Kennedy Space Center here? And there are many good reasons for that. But one of the most important is the best place to launch a rocket is on the equator. The rotation of the Earth acts like a slingshot to help you get that rocket into space. So the closer you can get to the equator, the more weight you can put up with less fuel. In order to take advantage of that rotation, you need to launch to the east. And they didn't want to go over any populated areas, they wanted to go over the oceans. So in the United States, if you go to the east coast and as far south as possible, Florida is where you end up. They had already started launching rockets from Cape Canaveral in the 1950s, so they had experienced personnel in the area. They'd already set up tracking stations on the islands going out to the southeast, so that was an advantage. They needed a big chunk of land for a buffer zone, and this was mostly swamp land. It was very sparsely inhabited, very inexpensive. So to get that land together, that was certainly an advantage. And climate is an advantage. Watching rockets in freezing weather doesn't work very well, and it's warm here most of the time. Although we always have to be very careful with the light here in Central Florida. We are a lightning capital of the United States. We compete with an area in the Congo of Africa for the lightning capital of the world. The little gator got his nose up right in the middle out here. Yeah. Anybody want to go pet the gator? Five dollars. Cash in advance. 
This little rocket coming up on the right is a Mercury Redstone rocket. This is the same type of rocket that took the first American to space, Alan Shepard, May 5th, 1961. On the, look on the ground underneath of it, a red metal plate is what we use as a flight deflector or a blast deflector for that rocket. Compare that to the shuttle. The shuttle had a flank stretch 58 feet wide, 42 feet deep, and 450 feet long. Well, our current Kennedy Space Center director is Robert Cabana. He is a four-time shuttle astronaut, and he was on the shuttle mission to put the first two pieces of the International Space Station together. He's going to give you a little introduction to Kennedy Space Center on the first video. Hi, I'm Bob Cabana, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to NASA's John F. Kennedy Space Center. From launching the first Americans into space to launching humans to the moon, we've launched and carried the dreams of a nation. None of it would have been possible without the tremendous team that made it happen here on the Space Coast. That has made possible the launch of every American vehicle that carried a crew into space since that first flight 50 years ago. During this tour, you'll get a unique behind the scenes look at how America wrote many significant chapters in human and robotic space history. Most recently, the Space Shuttle Program that launched 135 missions culminated in the assembly of the International Space Station in Low Earth Orbit. How do you like my family at Ducks down there? Those kids are almost as big as mama. The station is truly an engineering marvel and a testament to what we can accomplish when we all work together. I think one of the most enduring legacies will be the international cooperation that we've achieved in building and operating it. It's provided us the framework for how we will move forward as we explore beyond our home planet. Not as explorers from any one country, but as explorers from planet Earth. You're visiting the center at a very exciting time. Since the end of the space shuttle program, we've been working on groundbreaking missions that are paving the way to the future. We're focused on launching scientific and research satellites, restoring the U.S. capability to launch humans into space from American soil, forging commercial partnerships, modernizing our infrastructure and facilities to support the growing variety of government and commercial activities and missions, and working toward long-term human exploration missions on our journey to Mars. For the first time since the end of the Apollo program, which took us to the moon, NASA is taking steps to send astronauts into deep space with a new Orion Exploration Vehicle. We have the first spacecraft in history able to transport crews to destinations further than we've ever gone before, including Mars. As capable as Apollo was, the longest round-trip mission to the moon was only 12 days. Orion can sustain a crew of four up to 21 days, and when coupled with a habitability module, will allow us to undertake human missions to Mars, which will require close to a two-year round trip. The vehicle that will carry Orion is the Space Launch System, or SLS. SLS will be the most powerful rocket in history, but more importantly, it's designed to be flexible and evolvable in order to meet a wide variety of crew and cargo mission requirements. As I said, you're in for a very special experience today. Enjoy yourself as you get a unique look at NASA and Kennedy Space Center's past historic achievements, an exciting peek at our current innovative activities, and an eye-opening view of our amazing future. Again, welcome to the John F. Kennedy Space Center. We've got that uh, bald eagle nest coming up here to show you. Now, this is the time of year the eagles leave us and they head north for the summer, so you're probably not going to see a bald eagle today, but you'd never know. There's always a couple of stragglers hanging around. There's other trees up ahead of us on the left. Just left of that is the power lines. There's a nice gap there. You're going to look through the gap to the tallest tree just left of the power line. There's a large, dark mass up in the center of that tree. Looks like a big basket. Now, if you haven't seen it yet, there's a gap in front of that power pole. Look through the gap, past the pole to the tallest tree, right behind it. Through the gap, past the pole, tallest tree, other side of the power line. Through the gap, past the pole, right there. How's that for a nest? 
And that is a very active mass. They'll point it out again on the way back, give you some more information. Well, they started construction on Kennedy Space Center in the early 1960s when they decided they were going to go to the moon. They wanted to build that giant Saturn V rocket that had so much fuel on board they needed a three-mile safety zone around it. Well, they didn't have that kind of real estate left on Cape Canaveral, so they brought it over here and built Kennedy Space Center. And since December of 1968, every manned mission launched from the United States has launched from one of our two launch pads, Pad 39A or Pad 39B. Well, the next video is about that giant vehicle assembly building out ahead of us. Uh, every space shuttle, every Saturn V moon rocket assembled in that building. Uh, but as you're watching the video, watch for the crawler transporter. That's the tractor that we use to move the shuttles and the rockets around the space center. That would pick up a mobile launch platform, move it into the vehicle assembly building and leave it there. They would stack up the shuttle or the rocket on top of it. The crawler would go back in, pick up that whole rig and move it out to the launch pad and leave it there. The shuttle or the rocket would launch on the platform and then the crawler would go back out to retrieve that platform and bring it back so that we could uh, start that process all over again. Just ahead is one of the world's largest buildings by volume, the Vehicle Assembly Building, or VAB. It was built for the Apollo program in the 1960s and stands 525 feet or 160 meters high. The American flag you see on the front is 21 stories tall. The VAB is where everything comes together before a launch. The Apollo and Space Shuttle vehicles were assembled for flight in the VAB. This cavernous facility contains four huge bays where the spacecraft were assembled using massive overhead bridge cranes for highly complex maneuvers. Is that a pig over there by the woods? The black one, yeah, the claw pig, there he goes. <laughs> How many of those do you think we have around here? I've heard estimates that go as high as 12,000. That's what I call government pork. Today, the VAB is being updated to assemble our next human-rated launch vehicle, the Space Launch System, or SLS. The SLS is the most powerful rocket in history and has an evolvable design that ranges from 321 to 384 feet tall, depending on mission requirements. This rocket will someday help NASA to reach its goal of human exploration of Mars. The large tower next to the VAB is the mobile launcher being built for SLS. When completed, it will carry the massive launch vehicle on top of the crawler transporter to pad 39B. You will learn more about the launch of SLS when we get to the launch pad. Adjacent to the VAB is the launch control center. The distinctively shaped four-story building which houses the launch team. This is where the ground controllers, engineers, and launch director monitor the spacecraft and manage all the activities leading up to launch. Okay, well, if you're on the uh, wrong side of the bus here, that's temporary. We're coming back this way in just a few minutes. This vehicle assembly building is one of the largest buildings in the world, but it doesn't really look that way out here. There's just nothing much to scale it against. The stars on the flag are six feet across. We could drive the bus down one of the stripes. You could put old Yankee Stadium up on the roof and still have an acre left over for parking. It is the tallest single story building in the world and now sixth largest by volume, or the amount of space inside of it. If you could take them apart and restack them back up inside that building, it would hold three and a half Empire State Buildings. Over to your right is our press area. Press that come from all over the world to cover the launches of the shuttles and the rockets. Many of them maintain permanent facilities there. An American flag out there to base just right of the flag is a blue rectangular box. That is our brand new electronic countdown clock. They just put that out there around Thanksgiving. That replaces the one that had been out there since the 1960s. See the bird on the fence over here? He's got a white head, just like a bald eagle. That's an osprey, a fish hawk. They like to build their nests on top of poles. You see quite a few of those around. We are now approaching Launch Pad 39A. It was constructed for the Apollo program and is where all 12 moonwalkers began their historic journeys. 
You'll learn more about the Apollo program when you get to the Apollo Saturn V Center. Following the end of the Apollo program, Pad 39A was the site that launched Skylab, the first U.S. space station to orbit the Earth on May 14, 1973. Skylab provided America's initial experience with long-duration spaceflight. During 1973 and 1974, three Skylab crews were launched on missions of 28, 59, and 84 days. The first space shuttle mission was launched from here on April 12, 1981. Over a period of 30 years, there were a total of 135 shuttle missions. 82 lifted off from this launch pad. The reusable space shuttle system transformed the way we operate in space. The space shuttle launched dozens of communication satellites, as well as robotic spacecraft on groundbreaking missions to Venus, Jupiter, and Saturn. Not only did the shuttle deploy the Hubble Space Telescope in 1990, but it conducted five repair and upgrade missions that enabled the Hubble to literally rewrite astronomy textbooks. The Space Shuttle program ultimately assured its place in history with the complex on-orbit assembly of the International Space Station, the ISS. The shuttle made 37 flights to construct the station, which is larger than an American football field and can be seen at night orbiting Earth with the naked eye. This unique scientific platform allows researchers from all over the world to work on innovative experiments and help to enable NASA's long-term human exploration plans. This is a crawler way on your left. This is a road we use to move the shells and the rockets out to the launch pad. It's about the width of an eight-lane highway. They had to dig that down about seven feet, build it back in with various layers of fill, finally putting this river rock up on top. They chose river rock because it's smooth. It acts like ball bearings to cushion the right of the crawler, and it doesn't spark. When that crawler does go through, it pretty well pulverizes the top layers. This has to be regraded after every trip. Up ahead, you're going to get a look at a crawler transporter. Again, if you're on the wrong side of the bus, we're coming back in a few minutes. The crawler transporter is on the ground, and that's a big mobile launch platform sitting on top of it. We have the only two crawlers that were ever made, built in the early 1960s by the Marion Power Shovel Company out of Marion, Ohio. Shipped here in segments and assembled on slate. They are the largest self-powered track vehicles in the world, each weighing 6 million pounds. They carry three times that much. Have a surface area on top about the size of a baseball infield. Diesel engines power generators that run electric motors on the tracks. On the way out to the launch pad, the pad's loaded about one mile an hour. Empty, they race back at about two miles an hour. Fuel mileage on those, about 32 feet to the gallon. That's about 150 gallons of diesel per mile. Makes your SUV look pretty good, doesn't it? On the front left corner, you see a glass enclosed operator's cab. They have an identical unit to that diagonally across. The reason for that, it goes forward and neutral. If you want to go in the other direction, you actually have to leave the cab, walk around to the other side, and drive it in the other direction. Each cleat on one of those tracks weigh a ton. Mm. Since the end of the Space Shuttle program in 2011, Pad 39A has begun yet another transformation. Commercial developer SpaceX is modifying the pad to launch a larger version of their Falcon 9 rocket, called the Falcon Heavy. SpaceX is also building a crew capsule, capable of carrying astronauts, and will be launching crews to the International Space Station as part of NASA's commercial crew program. Another commercial provider to support NASA's crew transportation is Boeing. They named their capsule the CSC-100. Like SpaceX, Boeing's capsule will begin flying to the station later this decade. They will launch from Cape Canaveral Air Force Station just a few miles from here on a modified Atlas V rocket. With private industry stepping up to support lower orbit missions to the ISS, NASA can focus more heavily on deep space exploration, which you will learn about at Launchpad 39B. Okay, 
Okay, so here we are at Launch Pad 39A. This pad is still pretty much set up for the shuttle. In fact, it looks a lot like it would have the day after Atlantis launched on its final mission. We signed a 20-year lease to SpaceX for this pad, and they're modifying it now for their Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy rockets. They're putting a new building up here right in the middle of Crawler Way. They're not going to use that Crawler transporter. They're going to build those rockets in here horizontally. They're going to build a rail system to get them up on the pad, and then they'll have an erector that'll lift them up vertically for the launch. They expect that this pad operational by the end of the year for satellites, and around 2017, they expect to be launching astronauts International Space Station from here. There's a gator got his nose up in the water just off the bank here. I gotta have a two for one special today. Sorry, to play again. The tallest part of the pad is an 80 foot tall white lightning mass. That's about the same size as that Mercury Redstone rocket you saw earlier. Beneath that is the fixed service structure. That is actually the top two thirds of the service structure used during the Apollo program. But at that point, it would have been mounted on top of the mobile launch platform. The platform, the tower, and the rocket would all come down the crawler way together. On this side of the fixed service structure is the rotating service structure. That would close around.